Okay, good afternoon and thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, I'm really pleased that um, we've got Andy Marsh, the Chief Constable, so thank you for taking time out today. And what we want to do is answer, is for me to ask you questions, some have, have come from the public and, and some have come up from some of our forums, about the things that, that our local people are really interested in. So policing, the community safety and criminal justice matters. And, and I think t today is, we, we, ha we, we run a series of these, and today is very much about reflecting the transparency and the openness of the police. And that's why I think today is, is so important. So we're going to cover a number of themes <coughs> this afternoon. There's going to be police funding, a subject very close to both of our hearts, uh, domestic abuse, Brexit, and then we'll look at some of the questions from the public. So, as you know, and um, people will increasingly know, is that um, sub the Police and Crime panel have supported my request to uh, increase council tax precept by an extra two pounds per month. And I am really grateful that the, the public have given the support for this because we really need to, we, Andy and I produced the tipping point uh, a, a year or so ago and we were saying that you couldn't, can't keep cutting the police cuts have consequences and so it's really important that this will be the first time that we've actually been able to have found some investment about going forward. So I want to be very clear that first of all not all the money that the council tax is going to bring in um, is going to be for innovative stuff because some of it's got to just cover our, our costs. I need to be very honest about that. But we have going to um, put in about an extra four million pounds about increased recruitment and proactive police operations. So can you tell viewers where do you think that, what do you think that investment means for policing? So after what, what has been uh, eight to ten years of um, the organisation shrinking, we, we know with Avon and Somerset about 80 million pounds of real cost has been taken out. This is the first time in my, my time as a chief, and that's my, this is my seventh year as chief constable, that I've ever been able to consider um, growing a capability to deal with a new threat and a new problem. So we could um, quite easily sprinkle a small, small amount of money across the whole organisation, and whilst we might all feel a little bit better, the thing is the public wouldn't notice it. No. So my conversations with you, Sue, and the product of you listening to communities and stakeholders uh, and democracy is that we're going to focus a real growth, so it is an additional 100 officers, our establishment will increase by 100. We're going to focus them on three key areas which we know that our public and communities are concerned about. So we're going to focus them on improving our capability to catch burglars and reduce burglary of people's houses, such a horrible crime. Mm. We're going to focus on something that people will have heard a lot about in the media, um, knife crime, and we're going to focus them on drug dealing, and drug dealing significantly associated with knife crime. And we're going to um, bring our capability to bear on the people perpetrating those crimes, and we're going to make Avon and Somerset a very difficult place for them to operate. And so how will residents see the difference? They will see, we're going to call this Operation Remedy, mm -hmm. so we, we will um, be intervening from a preventative point of view. So they will be leveraging the, the resource of the whole force in some respects. So for instance, we've protected the number of officers and PCSOs in uh, neighborhood teams, and they'll be leveraging them to work with schools to give messages around preventing drugs crime, preventing knife crime, intervening early in partnership work. But the actual 100 officers working in Remedy, they're gonna be working seven days a week, and they'll be, they'll be conducted warrants and proactive operations to arrest drug dealers and uh, arrest people that are carrying knives and arrest burglars. And what do you think will be achieved? Well my experience is that where we focus on a crime type or a problem then we are successful. Mm -hmm. So I, I am actually very confident that we will improve uh, the number of uh, burglary crimes that we solve. My experience is w burglary is a sort of crime that's con con committed by people time and time again. So if we catch people do it we will probably confidently I will say, reduce burglary of people's dwellings mm -hmm. because they, they won't like us catching them. Mm -hmm. They will get locked up, some, some mm -hmm. of them. And then in terms of knife crime and drugs, m much more difficult whole society problems um, to deal with, but we will make an impact. We'll take more knives off the streets 
um, we'll get preventative messages out there and we'll deal with the most serious drug dealers causing harm to our communities. One of the questions I get asked by local residents and by the police and crime panel is that how do we make sure that not all this money just goes into Bristol? So how that um, how would you think in our more isolated, our rural communities, how will this affect them? Well, the, the, the first point to make actually, the crimes that I mentioned are not um, the sole preserve of Bristol. Mm -hmm. So just to give you an example, 41% of our knife crimes in Bristol, but 40% is in Somerset. And then the other 19% is reflected by Baines and North Somerset and South Gloucestershire. They're, 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 these crime types are spread throughout the whole force area. So let's look at drugs. We've mapped 34 county lines, organised crime groups. This is people using mobile telephony from other cities in the country, mainly London, to deal drugs. 34 of those gangs are operating outside of Bristol. So in very practical terms, we will base some of this capacity in Somerset, and some in Bristol and I absolutely guarantee you and you'll see it on our performance scorecard their activities um, will be spread across the whole force and if they weren't they wouldn't be effective. Sure, no I understand that and how can uh, local people help the police with Operation Remedy? Well it can help in lots of ways in, in fairness our, our policing only works because we have the consent and support of the public mm -hmm. and so if they see suspicious activity and which they believe, believe to be drug dealing or knife crime or burglary suspicious vehicles we'd encourage them to call it in 101 online uh, crime stoppers but some real practical ways that they can help as well so we have special constables we're always recruiting and um, we have volunteers we have um, citizen engagement we have all sorts of ways in which we need to bring our communities closer to our police so that we work together as a team um, to deal with uh, threat and harm and crime in our communities. Because of the money that local people are going to be paying, we are going to recruit for the first time in many, many years, a hundred extra officers. So what, does, what, does, what, will that, what will that mean to local people? How will they see that? And when can people start applying? Well, it's a big shift to turn around in terms of recruitment. It's easy to turn things off it's more difficult to grow mm -hmm. them. Um, you will know, Sue, that at no stage through austerity have we stopped recruiting altogether, but we very sig significantly slowed that capacity. And that actually, just to stand still and grow the extra 100, over a period of shy of two years, we'll be recruiting about 400 people. Mm -hmm. So we're not open for recruiting police officers at the moment. We open periodically. We don't say in advance when we're doing it, but I would say that we're a significant recruiting agency and look at, look at our website and the special constable um, recruitment is open. Mm -hmm. Which is great news, yeah. really great. Okay, so let's move on to domestic abuse. As you know, this is a subject that's, that's very close to my heart. Um, and domestic abuse takes up an enormous amount of, of, of police work. How do you view the, the issue of, of domestic abuse? And domestic abuse, uh, makes up al almost 40,000 crimes and incidents every year. So we're talking huge volume here and that, that is a huge range of incidents um, from same sex to men perpetrating offences on women and vice versa and then sometimes um, children, um, siblings, all, all manner of those offences could be classified as domestic abuse. Our, our objective is to solve the problem and prevent harm. We know from experience that it's unlikely somebody who is the victim of domestic abuse, has suffered it, is likely to, to report it to us the first time. Mm -hmm. So we're actually trying to solve some very deeply ingrained societal problems. We work with statutory partners, councils, but we work with some brilliant um, voluntary agencies to, to help us. And people um, reporting domestic abuse to us will receive a, a access to a whole variety of services and help. Okay, so what do you, what can a victim expect from the police? Well, first of all, you'd expect us to turn up. Mm -hmm. So domestic abuse is the sort of thing that we very significantly deal with face to face. And where somebody is at risk of harm right now, we'll treat it as an emergency. We'll, we'll get there very, very quickly. People um, should expect if a crime's been committed and the perpetrator is there, actually our start for 10 is that we will almost certainly look to arrest the individual that's, that we believe has perpetrated the crime. If we don't arrest them, we will take what we call positive action. So we won't just walk away. Mm -hmm. We will be significantly guided by what the victim or the person who's uh, reporting the crime to us, the incident wants us to do. But sometimes that individual has been significantly manipulated or controlled or coerced by the perpetrator 
in such a way that w we will take away the decision making and say, well, regardless of what you might want to do, um, we're going to arrest this person now. And sometimes we will even take what we call a victimless prosecution. Mm -hmm. And that goes back to the investment of the body worn videos, isn't it? Because they're really important for for the yes. victimless prosecution. So one, one of the things that I'm, I'm pleased that you did in 2016 was fund all of our officers and PCSOs will wear cameras and actually it has to be a very good reason for those cameras not to be turned on mm -hmm. at a domestic incident and this is what this is what we experience we will experience um, scenes of uh, damage to property we will see people hurt often with injuries we will see a devastating effect on children I think um, it, it, in this year alone we've made over 1,000 referrals to other agencies where children are involved in domestic incidents now if a perpetrator of a crime is shown that footage they, they tend to more readily accept what they've done and they tend to more readily um, plead guilty in court. So the body worn video is a significant help in domestic abuse. Okay, so how, can of, how are offenders dealt with that can prevent further harm? So we, we sometimes the criminal justice system is the right avenue, mm -hmm. but there are measures. Uh, we're one of a tiny handful of forces which is uh, offering um, a route into a restorative process where the perpetrator will attend uh, some vic victim empathy work and then a sword of Damocles hangs over them. It, in effect it's a conditional caution. So the conditions are you must attend this victim empathy course. Mm -hmm. If you don't you're going to go to court and mm -hmm. you're in all likelihood you're going to get a criminal conviction. Mm -hmm. what, what we found in the other forces that have been running pilots of this, it's not a nationwide thing, is that that is leading to significantly less reoffending and re-arrest. So we're, we're doing that but we're also engaging in multi-agency conferencing about how do we solve the problem mm. and that's called a, 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 a multi-agency risk a, a referral, referral panel so MARAC is what it's known as. Okay and um, what would you say to any survivors who may be watching this what would what would what would you say to them um, you know because it's these are very often mostly women I mean 157 137 uh, women get killed a year across across um, the country uh, what would you say to them because they are sometimes very very scared you know they've been threatened that their kids are going to be taken away from them their house is going to be taken mm -hmm. they're going to be kicked out they're going to lose their jobs so what what would you say to such survivors well I've witnessed a lot of this sort of crime uh, sadly so and I've, I've seen people living in the most unacceptable of circumstances in terms of fear and violence and threat and uh, sometimes the person that's subject of that can't see an escape route mm. sometimes the very act of violence or coercion is intended to make the victim feel worthless mm. and powerless and the individual perpetrating it all powerful uh, and sometimes the, the people in that position can't see a way out of it there is a way out um, so we would encourage people suffering violence to report it to the police we will listen we'll make a risk assessment, we will take positive action and really importantly we'll work with other agencies independent uh, violence advisors that are in some of our casualty departments um, partnerships that help people with rehousing and sometimes keeping them in a safe place there is so much that can be done so please don't feel powerless and do report it to us and that's the important message is there, that there's, there's many people that can help that you're not on your own uh, but you do need to report it. There is an awful lot of help out there that goes beyond our initial attendance. Okay, thank you, Andy. Moving on to values, um, as you know, the the the, the um, you refreshed the the forces mission, vision, and values. And I wonder if you can t to tell me about why you think that was really important to do that. So the the force values were were previously established in about two thousand and six, and an awful lot's happened since two thousand and six. We've seen a doubling in our serious and complex demand. Mm. We've seen austerity and other agencies shrink. We've seen the police shrink. We've seen public expectations change. We've seen the development of the internet and internet related crime. So much has changed. Now we want to be an outstanding police force. We want to offer outstanding services um, for our communities. We want to keep them safe and deliver your plan. So these new values uh, speak to our strengths, but they also speak to some areas that we need and want to pay some attention to. So that's why we've changed them. Okay, so let's talk about one of the, the, the first values, inclusive. Uh, I've been very clear as Police and Crime Commissioner, I know that we, I work very closely with you as well, that the important thing is we want the force to look like our communities. Um, what do you think, that, what is the benefit of that? Well, the, the, all of these values uh, speak internally and externally. Right. So, so all of them say something about what people should expect from us, 
but they also say something to the five and a half thousand people that work in this organization. Now we spend 80% of our money on our people and actually, believe it or not, national survey work shows that about 60% of people in employment bend themselves out of shape to fit in. So here, here's a benefit, an internal one. We need to create an environment where people can be themselves and they flourish and we're able to innovate and get the best out of them. So actually being an inclusive organisation is about valuing and getting the best from our workforce. But being inclusive is also about being everybody's police force. And, and sometimes that is, a, that is the, the, the six protected characteristics, including disability and race and ethnicity and religion and gender, but, but also it's about hidden uh, differences. Now disability is protected, but sometimes all of these differences are invisible. Mm. So mm. We, we need to be an organisation to be outstanding that really understands difference and actually sees it as an opportunity and a strength, not something to be frightened of or worried about. And if we are to be everyone's police force, and we are, and we need to be, then actually we need to be an organisation that anyone could see themselves working in. And anyone from those communities could see themselves sitting here talking to a police and crime commissioner about what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're striving to achieve. There have been some high profile incidents in, in Avon and Somerset and, and I suppose what you're working on is how do you create a culture where people accept personal responsibility and learn because that's what we've all got to do isn't it, we, we do have to mm. learn. Yeah, so what learning is, it is, a, is, a, is the second value, there's only four, so um, inclusion uh, first, learning. Now policing is a wonderful career for police staff and police officers and actually a wonderful career is one that gives you meaning, gives you purpose, but you keep stretching, you never quite, you never quite grasp it because you want to develop and do it even better. Mm -hmm. so if we can't learn, we will never be outstanding. But because of all of the very sensible scrutiny around policing, because we've got remarkable powers, we need to be held to account, and that's a significant part of your role, mm -hmm. but there are other players involved, such as the Independent Office of Police Complaints and our Professional Standards Department, uh, sometimes our people can feel great jeopardy about saying, I got it wrong, because let's say there's a clamour for them to be sacked, or, or somebody that might feel disproportionate in terms of a mistake they've made. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we need to balance the accountability with the learning, and we need to encourage our team to say, I got it wrong. Now, yeah. I, I'm at the moment going through a cycle of talking to all of the leaders in Avon and Somerset, so about 500 people about these values and my expectations and courageously some of our people have come forward and given scenarios where they've got it wrong and I'm happy to talk about where I got it wrong as well. I think we would both recognise if you don't make mistakes in life you're really not doing anything. So learning is something that we need to get better at and be much more open about. Sure. Thank you for that. Moving on very briefly to cover a bit on Brexit, I know that mm. most people will be bored out of their minds about it, but um, I think it's important that local people have confidence in the, cons in the constabulary. So how is Avon and Somerset preparing for Brexit? So we're preparing locally, mm -hmm. um, and we're preparing, preparing locally with our partners such as local authorities, um, hospitals, NHS, service providers, and that, that's running through a cycle of uh, fortnightly conference calls of something we call a local resilience forum. Mm -hmm. That's a forum that exists anyway to deal with any significant um, civil contingencies or um, disasters of any sort. And by the way, I'm not saying Brexit is a disaster. I should stay well away from that. But the local resilience forum are, are dealing with what might happen. So some of what might happen, for example, queues, queues around um, our ports, whether that's uh, cargo ports or Bristol airports. Some of what might happen is protest by people unhappy about what's happened. Some of might what happen is uh, a lack of supplies. So all of these things are being planned for locally. There are then other issues we need to plan for and the police um, use lots of powers to arrest people in other countries and exchange information, about 30, enabled by uh, European treaties. If there isn't a deal, those agreements will literally stop at 11 p.m. on the 29th of March. So we're Goodness. planning with national colleagues, the Crown Prosecution Service, other police forces, the Metropolitan Police, the National Crime Agency, to make sure that we've got contingencies in place to deal with it. And of course we had a really successful arrest of Mark Acklam, wasn't it, to use air from Switzerland, that we've been able to bring him back. And with the European arrest warrant, I know Switzerland's not in Europe, but will that affect, you know, will that, will that slow down the process post-Brexit if there isn't a deal? If, if it's about tracking suspects, exchanging information, 
uh, extraditing people under what is currently the European arrest warrant. We have contingencies to deal with all of those things. They're being coordinated by the Metropolitan Police for the whole country, uh, and I'm fully informed on them. But the volume of transactions they will be able to conduct and the speed with which they can conduct them by will be very significantly reduced. Mm -hmm. And so we will see um, some of it not happening and some significant delays. delays. Mm -hmm. And the, the fallback plans that we've developed largely are relying on um, treaties and legal agreements from the 1950s and so it's no surprise that they're much slower than the automated processes that currently sit in place. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, we had a, a question from a member of the public um, I wish I would just like to share. James on Facebook said, when 12 months and under prison sentences are abolished, what facilities, services and programmes will Avon and Somerset Constabulary have in place to combat and occupy the prolific offenders and known gang, gang members that are continuous, continuously being failed by the whole judicial system? <coughs> now James, I think this is a really important issue in regards to reducing prison sentences and it's a, a big issue. I think it's particularly very, very um, important to talk about it with the collapse of working links in the South West uh, last month who are charged to look after lower risk offenders. So while it's not in, in the Chief Constable's remit to challenge legislation, what do you see, what do you see the potential impact on policing? The, the management of uh, dangerous offenders and sex offenders is, is an area of our work which is very significantly unseen. And actually if I compare what we do now behind the scenes and unseen, checking people's computers, visiting them, making risk assessments, monitoring them, sometimes surveilling them, sometimes doing, doing some very covert work to keep people safe. But I know that's not what the police force I joined back mm. in the 80s did. Mm. So actually our, our role has become much broader. Now we, we um, shouldn't lead that work, I think most people would say that probation should lead that work, but we play a very, very significant role in that. And every day we have an incident report which I read of um, serious incidents and arrests and every day I see a whole list of people recalled to prison that we've arrested and that we've locked up, we've put in our custody suites and we've taken to court and actually I do see these um, very public failures as diverting our very precious police resources away from some of the things that we were just talking about such as domestic abuse. Yeah. So um, we've heard in the public arena of the, the, the cost of like 450 million pounds, actually there's a massive hidden cost in terms of what other agencies have had to do what my officers and staff have done and then the consequences to the victims of crime and then indeed the individuals who go around this rotating door in and out of prison on short-term sentences who haven't had the rehabilitation that we were told they were going to get. I, I do believe that's had an impact on crime and I have to say I'm disappointed. Yeah and so am I and I, and I hope that the government will will read the National Audit Office report and and reflect on on uh, the future of what we do with our probation service. Th there were many people, Sue, that when this change was made um, issued warning um, signals and messages that it wasn't going to work. Mm. Um, so I hope they listen better. Yeah, so do I. Um, that's about all we've got time for. And is there anything else you'd like to say? We, we have some bad weather. I mean, it doesn't feel like it with the spring coming. Um, but we had a couple of days of snow and my, my officers um, carried on doing their work. What, one of them walked from Shepton Mallet to Radstock, left, left home at four in the morning to get to work. But, but actually I got messages from across the whole force, Somerset and Bristol, about how supportive and how helpful communities had been, whether it was farmers getting um, things around, people bringing cups of tea around, roads being unblocked. So we've got some thriving and strong communities out there and I just want to say thank you to all of them uh, for helping my officers and staff. Great, thank you very much. And thank you for taking the time to, to, to join us this afternoon. We will have another uh, web chat probably in May. And I think what I really want to do is to reflect that this is always your police service. So please ask any questions that you want me to put to the Chief. Um, because what we want from our communities, we want robust communities where you are safe and you can feel safe. So until next time, thank you.